I have been disappointed with how little um, my community, the black community, has been talking about suicide and it is, it's Suicide Prevention Month and I just don't see a lot of information out there. And uh, I was watching um, Intervention, which is a show all about drug addiction. I also watch Hoarders from time to time. And on a lot of those shows, not a lot of those, well, on those shows, a lot of the people on those shows uh, had undiagnosed mental health issues. And for a lot of them, it's ADHD, like the hoarding, um, ADHD, um, and drug addiction, um, ADHD. So, and that undiagnosed mental health issues also leads to suicidality. Addiction leads to suicidality. People who feel overwhelmed with their hoarding want to kill themselves. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that it causes more mental health symptoms. And I'm frustrated on multiple levels. I'm frustrated because I live with four mental health issues myself. And I, I feel like if there had been more people talking about it, I would not have suffered so much. I'm frustrated because my I believe my daughter, um, pretty darn sure she has ADHD as well. And I'm trying to get her dad to get her tested and take it seriously. And he doesn't take mental health seriously. And that just that frustrates me. And then just seeing how dire it can be. There's so much of my life that uh, has been a, a poo-poo show that I can now trace back to trying to fit in a neurotypical society. Because what happens is, for those who don't know, is you start to internalize all your failures, all the ways that you can't do the things that everybody's always bitching and moaning at you about, right? Like I, I had a girlfriend yell in my face and basically tell me that my kid was going to have to take care of me and that, I, you know, if I can't figure out how to just stick with a job that I know is killing me, right? Like just buckle down and put your head down and just do what you got to do. And it was just like, I knew that I could not do that and that it would deeply impact my mental health. And it was like, people just wouldn't take your word, right? Just don't take your word for how bad it can get. Like you, they, I'm not, I'm, you know, like I shouldn't have to prove it to you, right? I shouldn't have to be at my lowest for you to be like, okay, yeah, you know, your mental health is, is serious. So it is a miracle, like truly the grace of goddess that I have not been arrested in my life. It is a miracle that I am not addicted to alcohol and addicted to um, opioids or heroin or cocaine or any of that. Um, it's a miracle that I don't have a gambling addiction. It's, it, but, but at the same time, there are definite consequences that um, untreated mental health issues have had on my life. I had to move in with my mother at age 42 or 41 because um, of, of different aspects of my mental health, but a large part of it was I needed, I, and I still need supervision. I need somebody to remind me to take care of myself. I need someone to tell me, you know, you've been up too late or to notice erratic behaviors or notice patterns, right? I need that level of supervision. I don't believe I'll ever be able to live by myself. And like, I really like being by myself, but I don't think that I can, I can trust my mind that I can be by myself. Right. So the thing about not really understanding your mental health issues is that there's, there can be so much shame. And what I'm recognizing now, because at now, now I'm aware that I have four mental health issues. Most of my mental health journey, I thought I only had bipolar too. But now I'm like, oh, I have ADHD, I have PMDD, I have CPTSD, right? So I have more mental health issues than ever, but I have less shame than ever. And and that the shame is is really is really what just kills. It's the shame, y'all. Like, um, it's not the diagnosis. It's not the diagnosis. It's the shame that we associate with the diagnosis. It's all the feelings. It's all the stories we make up about the diagnosis. And the more that I understand the way my brain works, the less shame I have. And the more I'm kind of mad 
at society for being so intolerable. I'm, I'm, I'm having to forgive myself for the ways I've mistreated myself in the past. I'm having to notice the ways that I allow other people to talk to me, the way I've talked to other people. Like just the, we, we embody so much neural, typical perspectives and beliefs and and just all these made up rules like now that i'm really seeing how much i mask and how much i like how much i people please and how much i'm tr i'm actually trying to blend <laughs> i'm trying to blend in which is funny because i'm sure people would be like really because this is you trying yeah this is me trying <laughs> this is me trying um and now i'm just like that it it, it makes sense why we are often so tired, like people who are neurodivergent, we're just, we can be so exhausted and like, it's like, I didn't even do anything. Why am I so tired? And it's because we're trying to make sense of a world that doesn't necessarily make sense to us. We're trying to catch on, right? And I didn't realize how much I'm, I'm scanning for clues on what is acceptable behavior? What are other people doing? What are people expecting of me? I'm like looking around, observing other people, reading the room to figure out what the appropriate way of being is. And instead of just being, right? Instead of just naturally just being, right? So it's wonderful when you can accept the diagnosis when you can look at it through many different perspectives because the other thing is like you know the diagnosis is, is through the lens of colonialism is through the lens of white supremacy where they're going to tell you there's something wrong with your brain and you need you need to be balanced and th their whole goal is to try to make you neurotypical and to um to fit into the pre the prescribed plan for you right like this is how you're supposed to behave and these are the social norms these are the rules just follow the rules and neurotypical neurodivergent people like we're like these rules are dumb these rules are stupid these are dumb rules i don't like these rules i've noticed some of that within myself so for example um i'm pretty direct i didn't realize that like i think that that's a neurodivergent trait like not everybody's as direct as I am, I'm very authentic. Like I really, I, I can lie. I don't like to lie. It does like, I'm not great at it. And I, I can't keep up with my lies. And like, I just, I, I, I just, I, I just doesn't sit right with me. I, I, it's hard for me, right? It's difficult for me to lie. I'd rather just tell you the truth. But like, so the small talk, right? Like a lot of neurodivergent people wouldn't like small talk. Like I, I, I can do small talk. I know the rules. Um, I can do small talk and I can, and I can talk about lighthearted, silly things but um i don't like hollow to me small talk feels hollow like i don't i don't get these are things i don't care about i'm not learning anything about you you're not learning anything about me this is not a real connection you know like what's the point right and so when i'm writing emails a lot of times i usually get to the point first and then i go back and i add small talk oh how are you i hope you're well and you know, how'd that go oh great can we get to the fucking point <laughs> what do you want right like i don't care how 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 the weather is like what do you want get to the point but society says you have to do the, you know, the niceties um things like thank you cards when people get you gifts for like what, weddings or birthdays like i i'm never gonna get around i, I never did right I, I had a wedding i don't think i ever maybe i did i don't know but if i did it was late as hell but like no, I'm not going to do that, right? Like, I'm sorry to whoever's offended. I remember my, my my friends who send me holiday cards. A, I'm never going to send holiday cards. And I don't I don't want yours. I don't want your holiday card. Stop sending me your cards. I don't want your card. But these are like some of those neurotypical like things that I, I think are dumb, right? Or just, or just like, or when people say, hi, how are you? And they don't really want to know how you are. I'm just like, don't say that to me. Don't ask me how I am because I'm going to tell you. And if you don't really want to know, don't ask. Like, don't just say it because it's an expression. Like, I don't, I don't like that. It's, there's just so much bluff in the neurotypical world and it's exhausting. And if you don't, if you don't participate in the fluff, then people see you as, you know, rude or antisocial or brash or obnoxious or whatever. And it's just like, I'm just, I'm just real. Like who has time for fluff? Life is short. Can we, can we get to it? Can we? So I like that about me. I don't, I'm, I don't want to embrace neurotypical ways. I kind of find neurotypical people boring in the sense that they're predictable and that there's such a fear of of taking risks. There's such a fear of being fully expressed. There's such a fear of like living out loud and just not, being overly concerned with 
um, your social ranking and, you know, what, what people are thinking and how it's going to affect you and impact you. Like, I just, I appreciate that because of my ADHD brain and my lack of executive functioning, I don't, I'm more likely to take risk and I don't think as much about, oh, what's, what's going to happen in the future? Like in the future, I'll be fine. I'm always going to be taken care of. I'm always going to be taken care of. Like I'll always be fine no matter what. I'm always accounted for. I'm always thought of the universe loves me. God loves me. We're good. So I like that I'm not afraid to say and be in the world like in ways that a lot of people are too embarrassed to be. I, my goal is not to be neurotypical. My goal is to fully accept myself as a neurodivergent individual. Yeah, that's my goal. And so what I can say is that there's still things in my life that are, you know, disorganized or, you know, that need addressing, right? But I don't have this deep, this deep seated shame where I feel that these things are a result of some deficiency or defect within me. What I understand is, is that considering how hard my road has been, because the, the thing is, is that when you mask, you, you can gloss over how, you know, because you don't, the, the thing about being a, you know, like a queer black woman who has neurodivergence is that you're always masking. I'm always masking. I'm always masking. I don't think my nature is really girly. Like I'm not truly a girly girl, but there are aspects of girly girlness that I like. So I, I can do it. But like, I, I, I don't really like makeup. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of energy. And then like right now, I got to take my makeup off at the end of the day. I don't want to spend the end of the day taking my makeup off. This is dumb. <laughs> um, I like getting my nails done, but I don't have the patience for it. And like, I was never one to really, really be elaborate with my manicure. Um, it's just a lot of ways that I feel like I have been forced to play the game. And so I tell myself and try to look for parts of the game that I actually do enjoy. But I'm kind of rediscovering who I am at my core. And I probably wouldn't even, if I, if I was truly at my core, I probably wouldn't even fully identify with like she, her pronouns. Like I wouldn't even truly fully identify with like woman I, I probably would identify more as a, a they a them um not wanting to be not wanting to be forced into any type of gender expression right where like you expect this of me um I definitely have you know like gone along I've, I've allowed people to put me in a dress and put makeup on me but like I, it's not really like I can do it and I can I can look cute but like it's not I don't know. There's times when I'm when that's that's who I am, but this is more who I am. Like glasses, hoodie. <laughs> this is more the who I am rather than like tight dress, makeup. Like mm, I'm not even really like comfortable in the clothes like that. So it's a rediscovering, and it's so it's it's kind of a beautiful process when you can eliminate the shame and and that's why like I like learning about my brain, especially in the context of like re-indigenizing mental health, re-indigenizing like how we look at disorders, right? Because I do feel it's a gift. Like and not in this not in the whole it's a superpower because it's it's difficult to have a neurodivergent brain in a neurotypical world. A hundred percent. But I like the way my brain works in a lot of respects. Because one thing that my brain is pretty good at, <laughs> to my detriment, is being present. It makes me time blind, right? It makes me forget like, oh shit, what do I have to do? And what time is it? And what, what day is it? What's happening, right? Like, I don't like, I'm not aware of what's the date? What's the time? And the thing is, it's crazy. They actually do have a really good sense of time, but it doesn't matter. It does. I'm still time blind. Um, but I'm very, very present in the moment doing this now, here and now, right? Um, even though sometimes my anxiety can get, can get the best of me, but generally I'm here. And I like that the unique connections that my mind makes. It makes me a better artist. It makes me, my, my, my fashion's interesting, like my, my ideas. Like there's a lot of things I really do appreciate about being a neurodivergent. It also makes me better at reading a room, connect, like reading, I can read animals. I can just kind of feel the energy in a room and in a space um, quickly. 
Um, I can walk into a new space and feel relationships, feel dynamics. Like, oh, you guys got tension. Like, <laughs> like I, I can pick up on that stuff real quick and be like, okay, I'm going to stay out of that. I'm going to avoid this over here, right? I can read a lot of energy. It's really been effective as far as helping me be an educator and connect with students, connect with people because of that um, ability to just pick up on a lot of nuances that, that neurotypicals aren't zoning in on. Because the thing about being neurodivergent for a lot of us is that we are hyper aware. We're actually oversensitive in a lot of ways and picking up on too much information, which be, which then allows, we, we get overstimulated. You know, I, I get overstimulated by other people's energy quickly and I really don't like cities. Um, I do not do well in cities. I don't like cities because overstimulation, like the people, and, and, and not just that, but there's also a lack of nature the lack of trees and green space and flowers, like it just, I don't do well with that. I was watching um, Star Trek and I was like, I had a realization because I've always, I always thought I wanted to go to outer space, but I was like, yo, there's like no sun in outer space. Like there is, but there isn't. And like, it's black or like dark. Like it's, I, I would get so depressed in outer space and I never like, I'm so glad I never went. When were you going to go, Charlotte? I don't know. My dreams, I was going to go, y'all. Um, but now that I'm reflecting on it, I'm like, I, I, and then the other thing, oh, this was this one, this one messed me up. I couldn't go for walks in outer space, y'all. You can't just leave the spaceship and go strolling through freaking space. Like, no, I'm good. And then what if your spaceship breaks down? There's no AAA. There are lots, lots of worries, but point being see that was all random ADHD shit just embrace your brain just love your brain and then give yourself so much compassion and so much grace because it is so difficult to love your brain when people are always telling you there's something wrong with you and you know if you just tried harder and if you're just more organized and if you could just get your shit together and just you know put your head down and just endure that sucky job like knowing that you can't right? Like wanting to, to, to bash your head into a wall. And that's what's frustrating is that this is why people turn to addiction. So people turn to addiction because they're self-medicating. They're trying to feel better. And I, I can, I can say like, I, I have a marijuana dependency like me and, and I've been self-medicating with, with marijuana since, since my teen years. And it's one of the things I use to help my brain slow down. I use it to help me sleep. Um, I use it for, for dopamine hits, like, it has been a a lifesaver for me multiple times when I was suicidal. So whereas alcohol, because I don't drink, I don't do anything else. Um, alcohol makes me want to in my life. But marijuana would give me the perspective to be like, you know, what are we doing? It's not that bad. So like for me, uh, if I was on the on the ledge and wanted to kill myself, if I just smoked some weed, I could I could calm it down and be like, all right, you know, it's not so bad, but um, alcohol would make me be like, just, just jump, just go, right? So it's a miracle that I am not addicted to substances because a lot of people with untreated mental health issues, they internalize all that self-loathing. Your brain is like racing, but everybody tells you that, you know, it's just you and just all in your head and you suck, you know? Um, and the meds can help regulate your brain chemistry, right? It can help help your brain. So a lot of people are self-medicating. They're looking for that peace. They're looking for that peace. And they end up a drug addict. You know, and especially when you take the self-medication in combination with a deep shame and, and feeling guilty and feeling that self-loathing and feeling like it's your fault that you can't do these things that you want to do. So that's why I, I, I want to see more people talking about, you know, mental health and suicidality, especially, especially the black community, because it's, it's devastating um, when it impacts our community. And it leads to all of the things that are having a detrimental effect on our community. It leads to poverty. It leads to um, um, domestic violence. It leads to, you know, gangs, it leads to drug addiction, it leads to prostitution, it leads to child trafficking or, or sex trafficking, all these all these horrible things that nobody wants in their community. And like a lot of it could be alleviated if we had more safe spaces for people to say, I need help. I need help. 
right? Like I have, I need help. I'm not weak. I'm not lazy. I'm not, you know, full of the devil because a lot of the things we say are very unhelpful. I'm going to wrap this up and just uh, with this, these last things, like these are things not to say black folks. Stop saying this. Stop saying this. Every time you say these things, you're taking, you're, 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 you're ending lives. People are hearing this and they're, they're, they're seeing that you are not be somebody who has any compassion. And there's so many ways that we let people know that they can't come to us with their mental health issues. Do not say that people have committed suicide, like committed murder. They ended them li their lives. They they unalived themselves. They they um they ended their lives. Uh, I forgot the other phrases, but or died by suicide, but not committed suicide. Stop saying that people are going to go to hell um, for um, dying by suicide. Even if you believe that, that's not helpful. Nobody needs to hear that shit. And if they're committing, if they're dying by suicide, they are already in hell. Stop saying that, uh, it's a sin. Again, not helpful. Or when people are like, oh, think of all the people who will miss you. Um, you know, we need you. This isn't about you. <laughs> isn't about you i'm selfish right oh think about the people who need you i am at the point where i want to end my life and you want to hit me with that this is about me and the pain i'm in you have to imagine how bad somebody has to feel to get to the point where they want to end their lives and to admit it to you because there have been numerous times in my life where i wanted to end my life but i was not trying to tell nobody i wasn't going to tell them that's between me and me i'm not gonna have a conversation with you about it it takes so much effort and energy to share that with somebody and vulnerability and and when people come back with these insensitive statements it's just like i mean why don't you just hand me a gun like you're so unhelpful with this um another one is um just get on your meds just get on your meds. Just get it together. What's wrong with you? Uh, I had a family member uh, say that to me, yell, yell that in my face during a time when I was suicidal and extremely vulnerable. And it was just like, are you serious right now? But these are the things that people will say. And these are extremely hurtful things. And what it does is it makes people who are in pain, who need help, not ask for help. When you've been traumatized and you've asked for help and people people throw it back in your face, then why would you ask for help, right? Why would you do that? So we have to look at how, as a community, we contribute to people's mental health issues. We contribute to the suicide rate. I mean, the suicide rate is going up in the Black community. It, I think it was up like 60% with African-American males and 180% with African-American women. And it's going up with youth. And it is the second leading cause of death with, with young people you know, nationwide, not just uh, Black kids, but nationwide. It's a big deal and yet we don't want to talk about it we don't want to talk about it uh we're too crazy we're too concerned that people are gonna call us crazy and like i feel like i am willing to have people call me crazy i don't i don't care and you know what sometimes i am crazy that shit fucking fits i also don't think that crazy has to be a bad thing like i've always enjoyed being weird like in, in school they used to call me weird even though i still have friends because the reality is is that I said, be like being predictable and doing what's expected is boring. Is that's boring? That's been done. That's not interesting to me. It's not interesting to a lot of us. And so I like being somebody who's willing to do the things that y'all find inappropriate or unacceptable or whatever. Like as long as ain't nobody getting hurt, who cares, right? And and I like challenging a lot of these things that we just accept and just go okay, you know, just go along to get along. But nobody's ever thinking about anything. Nobody's ever questioning anything. Like I appreciate that. I like rocking the boat. I like making people think. I don't want to be neurotypical because, like I said, I feel like I just feel like a lot of people who are neurotypical are really afraid to truly be themselves, and I don't want to be that. Um, so I don't mind being. I don't, whatever people want to label me, right? When I, when I tell people that I live with bipolar, like I'm sure that X percent writes me off, right? Because they're like, oh, you crazy. I don't care. We have to talk about these issues. The reality is, is that a lot of us are crazy. I just know, I know the various ways that I'm crazy. I know how my brain, you know, goes off the rails. Do you know how your brain goes off the rails, right? Are you aware of your mental health issues? Because this, this, this country will give you mental health issues. In addition to when you when you re-indigenize the, the notion, it's like, am I really mentally ill? Or is the idea of participating in capitalism to this level what's insane? Like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane that we're working 
even for 40 hours period, right? 35 plus hours, because some of y'all work 70 hours or just ridiculous schedules. Like that you're giving all that time to your job, that your job owes you, owns you like that, that you're missing out on like living real life. Like you're missing out on like being outside and, and, and noticing the animals and the beauty of the sky and your perfect cup of chai and really enjoying meals and people you love. Like, I don't want to be neurotypical if being neurotypical means being a workaholic and, you know, being caught up and anxious about the news and, you know, just all, all the, the, the behaviors, you know, eating a bunch of crap food and uh, being unhealthy. And I don't want that life. I don't, I refuse to live that life. I'm not going to put my head down and work at a job that I know is killing me because people got to eat. There has to be another way. There has to be another way and I'm going to find it. And it's okay if people are like, you live your life in a weird way. I don't care. I don't care that y'all know I live with my mama. I fucking love it here. <laughs> I love it here, right? Like America would be like, oh, success is you living by yourself. I would have killed myself living by myself. And to, and to do what? To prove to y'all that I could, right? To prove to people, like to imaginary people, like, oh, look at me living by myself. For what? I don't need to be living by myself. I'm neurodivergent and I need to be in the company of people who can help me, you know, stay healthy in a world that doesn't have any love for people who are neurodivergent. And I'm not ashamed of that. I don't care. I love it here. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it's working for me, right? It's working for me. I've never been as healthy in my life. So let the shame go. When I first got here, I, I was, I was deeply ashamed. I was deeply ashamed and I was like trying to figure out like how soon can I get out of here and I felt so bad and now I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. And it's so freeing when you let go of all the stories of this is how life should have gone for me. Like it, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't. And I was dealt a different hand. I was dealt a neurodivergent hand. And so I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I'm still alive. I've been dealing with suicidality for 34 years. Um, been, spent most of my life undiagnosed with multiple mental health issues, serious, severe mental health issues. And it's like a miracle that I have college degrees. It's a miracle that I have healthy children. Like the things that have gone well it's 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 amazing it's amazing that i have uh such a good driving record when like driving gives me so much anxiety i didn't get my license till i was 25 okay like i i do not like to drive um but i've had to drive like i was an uber driver for a couple years like again masking right again masking like i don't why am i uber driving i i do not like to drive right um when i got married i used to cook all the time i, I hate cooking right? Again, masking. I'm um, trying to per per fall into the role of what he expected of me, you know, as a wife, like all of these ways that I put aside, like I've, I've been conditioned to put aside what my truth was. Like my truth is fuck cooking. Let's order out or you cook or somebody else can cook. I don't want to do this shit, right? Like that's my truth, right? Like sometimes I'm into it, but like I've never cooked a Thanksgiving dinner. I've never cooked like gumbo. Cause I'm always, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to stick around for that roux. Like I'm going to lose interest because that sounds boring as hell, right? Like toasting the flour and the oil and making the perfect consistency. And if you don't do it right, it ruins the whole pot of gumbo. I'm just like, I know me, I would just lose interest because there's no dopamine and toasting freaking flour and oil, like boring. Uh, same with Thanksgiving. There's too many details and you do all that work for what? Like, no, I'm not, I'm not chopping all those onions. I'm not doing it. So that's my truth, right? Like, that, that's my truth. My truth is I'm not super girly. Like, I didn't get my first manicure until I think my 20s. First pedicure was like my, like, I was, yeah, it was, it was late in life, right? Because I just, I don't, I don't care about these things. Um, but so much masking, so much doing the things that were expected of me instead of really getting in touch with what is my truth? What do I want to do? What's comfortable for me? So I'm curious to kind of see what that looks like as I live the rest of my life. I do feel like my style might get more masculine because I'm just not, I'm, I, I, de I definitely have a girly side of me, but I don't think it's as pronounced as I have presented to the world. Um, yeah, I mean, We'll see, but I enjoy kind of rediscovering myself and then just giving myself a lot of patience and grace and just not, 
I don't need to do and act as everybody else is doing and acting. And then the people who make me feel uncomfortable about how I show up aren't my people. I like other weirdos. Like I've always liked other weirdos. I've always liked people who've been unafraid to be themselves and just doing or doing something where I'm just like, that's some weird ass shit. Or like, that's like, look at you not giving a fuck. Like I've always been, I've always been drawn to people who are willing to push the boundaries on, you know, social norms that we just think, you know, are expected, like says who. So I've always appreciated that. And now I know why it's because typically neurodivergent people, we, we, we attract each other which is why I said before, if you like my content and you like me, you probably learned that virgin. You probably a weirdo too. Um, we attract each other. We attract each other, which makes sense. Like I'm very close to my mom and she's neurodivergent. My daughter and I have a special connection. She's neurodivergent. I believe my son's neurodivergent too. Um, we attract each other and we have an understanding of each other because we are similar, right? We, we make annoying sounds too. We sit weird in our chair too, right? Like we have weird relationship with food as well and sleep and you know like we make weird connections in our brain and we interrupt and eye contact is can be a thing um so yeah we tend to attract each other so that is my I just needed to get that off my chest I've, I've been really just um frustrated with the lack of conversation in the black community about mental health and knowing the impact, knowing that when we don't talk about this, what it can lead to and just getting people to take it seriously. And it's frustrating because it, it's like, it's another, it's, it's a fourth, it's a fourth fucking identity, um, for me. So as a, I'm already, I'm already dealing with, uh, not being white in a society that loves white people, not being male in a society that loves males, not being straight in a society that loves heterosexual people, and then not being neurotypical in a society that loves neurotypical people. So it's like, what that means for me is that I'm very rarely in a space where I'm all the way comfortable, right? So, um, I don't know how else to put it, right? Like I, I, I tend to keep my space black because that that's where I'm comfortable. Like I gotta not be dealing with anti-blackness, um, but even within the black community, there's a high level of sexism. Um, and just accepted, like you know, that males are superior, some bullshit. And I'm just like, I'm always challenging that. Uh, from the black community, there's a lot of LGBT um, homophobia, or people want to use their religion to justify their homophobia, their transphobia, and I've, uh, you know, that that's not comfortable. Um, and then not wanting to talk about mental health or not understanding how, you know, neurodivergence means that I'm not going to show up in the same ways that everybody shows up. And you, there needs to be space for that. Like, don't expect me to behave as everybody else behaves. Um, and not just me, but other people, we need to have more of an expansion of, of accepting people. Um, so it's rare that I'm in a space where I'm I mean, this is why I keep to myself and I create spaces for me. Like my, all my clients are black women. Um, a lot of them are, are queer, a lot of them are neurodivergent. So that feels like a safe space. But a lot of times in the world, there's some part of me that feels threatened. I mean, shit. I, I mean, I, not really because I thought everything's, you know, one. All, everything's like, I'm not worried the universe has got me, but um, uncomfortable, right? Like wanting, like wondering if... I, if, if I, I'm going to be accepted, if all parts of me are going to be accepted, right? And then just um, remove myself from spaces where I feel like there's any type of shade, right? The vibe doesn't feel right. If, 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 if we're on any parts of my identity, like I'm just not going to be in the vicinity because I'm very sensitive and I'm not going to take, like I don't want to take that home with me. I don't want to, I don't want to feed into shame or guilt because again, the difference, um, for me these days, it's just that I don't have that shame and guilt. And and that has freed me up from all of this. Like, oh, my life should be here. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I mean, with all the conditions I have, I, I, I very well could have been dead by now. So I am doing amazing considering that I'm still alive. I'm six feet above ground. Actually, I'm not six feet, but I'm five feet above ground. Um, so I'm doing great. And so are you. And now I'm going to go to sleep because that's part of my self-care plan. I hope this was helpful. Please share it with people who need it because we dying out here and somebody has to say these things out loud. I have free classes on Eventbrite. You can find me there if you ever want to learn how to get into um, coaching as a means to save your life. 
which is how I used it. Good night.